Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I would like to begin this morning with a word of gratitude, a word of thanks for the genuinely warm welcome my family and I have received amongst the saints of St. Barnabas. For many months, that hospitality has come from your associate pastor nominating committee, a truly, truly gifted and wonderful group of individuals. But it has also, by extension, been through you. From my very first conversations with the committee back in January, this congregation has increasingly felt like home. And that feeling has only grown as we have been in your midst this morning. And if I believe anything about who God is or what Jesus Christ desires the church to be, it is that each of us are called to love one another and the world as family and to create spaces of fellowship and hospitality amongst one another. That is the church at its best, and I've already begun to experience that amongst you all. Sometimes I feel the need to take a step back and appreciate just how curious our enterprise as the church really is. That the actions of a wandering rabbi in the backwaters of the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago have led each of us in the year 2019 to be here. It is strange to think about, and it's wonderful to think about, and I hope it inspires us to remember just how special and just how important the mission of the Church of Jesus Christ really is. Of course, if we are going to reflect on our purpose and our calling as people of faith, Paul is the master storyteller and teacher to go to. And nowhere does he more clearly articulate his vision for who Jesus was and what the church is called to be than in his letter to the church in Rome. Romans begins as a, as a theological document. Paul tells us what sin is. He tells us how Jesus' death and resurrection overcame it, and then how we experience it in our own lives. That's all in chapters 1 through 11 of, of Romans. And so in chapter 12, where we read from today, Paul changes his trajectory a little bit. And for all but the very last few verses of this book tells us how we individually are called to respond. Chapters 12 through 15 are almost a mini book of Christian ethics. 
And if we are being completely honest with ourselves about what Paul writes, it might be best to categorize his words as almost fantasy. Have you ever had an experience that didn't live up to your expectation? Like seeing a movie and discovering that it only vaguely resembles the description that you read online? Or scheduling an appointment for maintenance at your home and discovering that the service person has a very different understanding of what constitutes a two-hour time window. My favorite was syllabus day at school. My parents, my mom Peggy is here today, my parents tell me that in elementary school our teachers actually did a, a really great job back in Kansas City doing back to school night, connecting with, with parents. But my wife Grace and I both attended the same high school and let me tell you, syllabus day was a little bit different at Shawnee Mission East. You might remember syllabus day, each teacher laying out their expectations for what the uh, material would be covered, how the class was supposed to, to be structured. Syllabus day was where we made name tags that were going to be on the front of our desks every day when we were in class. It was where we learned how many unexcused absences would affect our grade, how we were supposed to label our assignments, what books we were going to read, how quickly teachers could expect it to, to email us back. Each class, each teacher looked a little bit different, but across the line, it was organized and orderly. It set a grand picture for what the school year was going to be. And then by about Thanksgiving break, those rules started flying out the window. It turned into the Wild West. Name tags were long gone. Homework, which was never supposed to be accepted late, remember, that kind of became the norm. Five people were out at the restroom at a time. Of course, if there was a substitute teacher, everything went out the window. In my freshman biology class, in which our final project was supposed to be 50% of our grade, our teacher canceled it altogether right around spring break, which we were suspicious had to do with him retiring at the end of the year. By the end of that school year, syllabus day seemed like a distant dream which we barely even remembered. I suspect I am not alone in reading Paul's words from Romans and feeling like they were something of the syllabus for the early church. Sure, Paul, those are great ideas. But it's well into second semester, and you can't possibly expect us to be abiding by this anymore. Bless those who persecute you. Don't repay evil for evil. If your enemy thirsts, give them a drink. In theory, sure, Paul, that sounds great. But we all know how the world really works. Don't you, Paul? But the reason we're here 2,000 years later is because across the centuries and across every single corner of the globe, people have discovered that those words are true, that they give life, and that while to many they might sound hopelessly naive, they are in fact more than an ethics lesson. They are profound in their boldness and their importance. I'm not sure if I have words to describe my excitement for being here today before you, and if you feel led by the Spirit in your vote to be your next associate pastor. I'm excited because in this congregation I see an energy and a dedication to doing church together in a way that transforms those inside these walls and offers a important word of hope to those outside of them. You do church really well, I guess I mean to say. And friends, if I'm going to be honest, I love church. I really do. Like a lot of kids, when I was growing up back in Kansas City, I spent a lot of time at church because my parents made me. But late in high school, I began to realize just how at home I felt 
on Sunday mornings and in the youth loft at our church. In fact, I married one of those friends from youth group, so you got to be careful about those youth group crushes. Remember that. <laughs> After leaving for college, whether it was leading middle school ministries in Lincoln, Nebraska, working during the summertime at our Presbytery's summer camp, serving as a pastoral intern at my home church, or during seminary, serving as a public policy ministry intern or a hospital chaplain or as an uh, intern at a, at a congregation in suburban Richmond, Virginia that I loved dearly. On all of my journeys prior to ordination, my journey was shaped by groups of people who I loved dearly and who showed me in thousands of little moments how the gospel of Jesus Christ can impact our world. These last two years, I've served as an inter, uh, pardon me, I've served as a resident pastor in Indianapolis, and I've had the opportunity to hone my professional skills in pastoral care and in mission, in worship leadership, Christian education, youth ministry, on down the line. There were four residents at a time at Second Presbyterian in Indianapolis. We met each week with the senior pastor to watch and critique each other's sermons. We discussed books together. We had all sorts of professional development opportunities. I especially loved the opportunity this last year to launch their new Sunday evening blended worship service. I am grateful to Second Presbyterian of Indianapolis because not only did my family and I find true friends and gifted colleagues there, but I'm a better pastor today for having served with them. And across these years, I've also learned more about how to be a husband and a father while serving in ministry. These are the people and the places who have shaped me, and they've taught me what church looks like when it's at its best, and at times also taught me what it looks like at its worst. It is with eager anticipation that I look forward to joining my story and my family's story with yours. In these coming years, I hope to learn from you, to watch the Spirit work through you at events like the Back to School Health Fair, meeting the kids of the Boys and Girls Club who call this space home during the week, to journey with you to the fall retreat, to lead worship alongside middle and high schoolers on Youth Sunday. And as the session of this congregation continues its season of discernment, to imagine ways to bring either, even greater depth to the ways St. Barnabas does ministry and expand even further the, the impact on one another and on this community. No matter what shape that takes, though, I hope we never lose sight of the fact that this work matters. Christ calls us to love God and one another and to do so no matter the cost, no matter how foolish it might seem or how naive we might sound. We live in a world desperately in need of good news. We live in a time where unconditional love is rarely found. Thank God we have friends to join us on our journey of faith because as the church, we have much to do. Friends, I look forward to living this out with you together. Amen.